I would uh, uh, I would start with an introduction for uh, Mr. Ganesh Bagler. Uh, so Professor Ganesh Bagler is an inter interdisciplinary researcher and is, co is considered the pioneer of computational gastronomy. It's the emerging data science that blends food with artificial intelligence. He has an audacious dream of transforming the global food landscape through data-driven innovations. And when I'd heard of this work that uh, Professor Ganesh Bagler is doing, I was immediately excited because it's so hard to connect food with data or information. And I felt that it's going to be an extremely relevant talk for our World IA Day New Delhi edition. And with that, I would request Professor Ganesh Bagler to please come on stage and share your presentation with us. Thank you for the introduction, Sovik. Let me get started. Food is extremely personal. Food is subjective and it's a creative endeavor. So I'm sure most of you are wondering how food possibly be connected with data, data science and information architecture. So my endeavor in today's talk is to unravel how computational gastronomy as a new data science is unraveling this area where we are trying to blend food with data and the power of computation. So I am Ganesh Bagler. I am affiliated with Center for Computational Biology at IIIT Delhi. Let me see whether my slides are transitioning. Yeah. So I am affiliated with Center for Computational Biology at IIIT Delhi. And we at IIIT Delhi are dedicated to the core practice of computer science and allied areas of which computational biology and now computational gastronomy is one of them. To tell you very briefly about myself, I was an aspiring astronomer as a teenager. I always wanted to be under the sky and discover new stars and do astronomy and astrophysics, which I could not. But it has been a long journey from being trained in physics than in computational techniques, all the way in PhD in computational biology to where I am today, where I'm doing computational gastronomy and investigating food. So it has been a not so short journey from astronomy to gastronomy, to put it very uh, in, a, in a succinctly. Having said that, let's come to the definition of what is computational gastronomy. It is a data science which blends food data with the power of computation for achieving data-driven food innovations. It's a mouthful of a definition, but it succinctly puts uh, together all the key terms which are relevant in the context of computational gastronomy. You would have noticed already that the word data has been repeatedly coming in this uh, definition, telling us the relevance of information and data while we are looking at food from a data science perspective. Uh, when, we when, when we think about food, we don't think about it from a data point of view. As I said, it's highly subjective. It's a creative endeavor. In fact, it's a magical phenomena. When you look at food and cooking, it is about transforming raw ingredients in, uh, into cooked delicious recipes. And that is a magical phenomena. And cooking is a very uniquely human endeavor apart from ability to speak, this seems to be one of the abilities that Homo sapiens have developed over a period of time and which is rather unique to us. Cooking is in fact considered to be central to the evolution of disproportionately large brain sizes that we have, which have again contributed to the creativity and the artistic endeavors and mathematical abilities that we have, uh, even abstract abilities that we have. To an extent that it is considered that cooking is very, very central to being human itself, right? Having said that, we have evolved from being a very prim primordial species to what we are today, species which dominates the face of the earth by way of uh, technology, by way of uh, all other aspects that homo sapiens can be attributed with. But at the same time, ironically, we have reached a stage where we are plagued with the diseases of lifestyles, wherein we seem to be plagued with these diseases such as cardiovascular disorder, obesity, and type 2 diabetes, 
which can be attributed to many factors, but food is one of the important factor. Diet seems to be one of the key factors. And thereby, it looks as if looking at food in an intense manner from a data science perspective is important for us to be able to investigate it, to understand it better, and to make our lives better. That is where information architecture, data, information science plays a huge role because food has not been seen until recently as a data science per, from the data science purview. It has not been seen. Uh, it's a very complex theme. It has multiple fact components to it. I'll be talking about those. What are the what are the different aspects that the food is uh, characterized with, and they can be seen from a data science perspective. So, in my in today's talk, whatever I'll be presenting essentially provides you a view by which we are looking at food and trying to make it understandable. We are like trying to look at food from a data perspective and making it computable in a big way. And this has not happened until recently, only, only in the few recent research articles in the last five to six, seven years back, people have been looking at food from a data architecture and information science perspective. One of the components that characterizes food is that of the traditional recipes. Those are the capsules, the traditional capsules that have been passed on to us from generations to generations. Then we have ingredients that go into the recipes, their flavors, the nutritional value of the ingredients, as well as the health impact of these ingredients by virtue of consuming them. So all of these components are one of the easy way by which we can think of organizing food, organizing uh, the cooked food that we end up consuming on a day-to-day -day basis. So in my lab, we have been building data structures and algorithms corresponding to each of these elements of food and trying to put the jigsaw pieces of food puzzle together so as to make data-driven food innovations possible. So this is the story of data-driven food innovations that I'm going to tell you. But before I get into telling you what is the future of the food when seen from information science perspective, let me tell you a story that began in IIT Jodhpur where I was working as an assistant professor in 1914-15, where we started asking a curiosity-driven question. And the theme, one of the themes that, uh, the key theme that the today's uh, IIT uh, in 2021 is being held is that of curiosity. So it's very uh, interesting that this was the question that we were asking when we began our journey into computational gastronomy, which was not named so at that point of time. Only in retrospect, it is being called as computational gastronomy. The question that we asked was, why do we eat what we eat? This is a deep philosophical question and a very tough one to answer, if I may say, the reason being that well, all the components uh, of food related matter of what we eat are not easily available. But at the same time, we know that what we eat are recipes, which are nothing but combination of ingredients. By making such a reductive uh, reductionist approach, by taking that approach, we can now transform this question into this one. Why do we combine ingredients the way we do? Is there a rule? Are there formulae by which we are using certain combinations of ingredients more frequently in our recipes as opposed to other combinations? Well, that's an interesting question to ask. And you can think about if there are answers to this uh, kind of a question. Turns out that a mature chef who has been practicing food and cooking for a while has had an answer to this question. And this answer came from a chef, a chef Heston Blumenthal from United Kingdom proposed a hypothesis called the food pairing hypothesis, in which he suggested that ingredients that taste similar tend to go well with each other. And that is what was the proposition that was given by the food pairing hypothesis. It essentially says that if there are two ingredients and if they have similarity in them, and we'll see how we define similarity very briefly, and if the similarity is more, then the propensity of they being used in the recipes would be higher. That's what was suggested. And in one of the research articles published in 2011, this proposition was in fact shown to be true for the Western cuisines. The Latin American, North American, Eastern and Southern European cuisines, it was shown that indeed food pairing hypothesis tends to hold true when you look at recipes coming from these cuisines. What was not done was to look at 
cuisine such as indian uh, india's indian cuisine which has got a long history and is characterized with diversity be it, it is culturally rich and has got diet uh, health centric dietary practices so it had not been seen in the context of indian cuisines which is what we wanted to do when we started our investigation in 2014 by collecting the data of various aspect of indian cuisine so how do we go along and start collecting the data of recipes ingredients and create a repository which will help us answer the question on food pairing in the context of indian cuisine well we had to find repositories that are already available online since we had to collect it from online repositories so tarla dalal was one of the repositories that we fixated upon after looking at various other repositories such as ndtv.com sanjeevkapoor.com and others because tarla dalal had a very structured database of recipes coming from a length and breadth of the country which are pinned down to various regional cuisine so we collected a diverse set of 2543 recipes which were coming from bengali gujarati jain maharashtrian mughlai punjabi rajasthani and south indian cuisines as you can see these are while they are not comprehensive in terms of representing the whole of india they are definitely are representative of most of the indian cuisines that you can think about so these recipes were composed of around 193 ingredients and each of these ingredient can further be structured into one of the categories can be classified into one of the categories exclusively such as that of cereal dairy flour fruit herb spice pulse vegetable etc as you can see that all of a sudden what was otherwise qualitative what was otherwise personal has been transformed into a data science we have created a structured re uh, repository of recipes wherein we have recipes ingredients within them and the categories to which they belong to but incidentally to be able to answer it from the food pairing perspective we need to look at their taste and odor because taste and odor are the primary factors because of which a given ingredient is chosen to be a part of a recipe and these ingredients act via what are called as the olfactory and gustatory mechanisms of human body by which they trigger sensory mechanisms and thereby giving rise to their uh, selection by the cultural mechanisms well what we did further was to collect the data of flavor molecules which are the key contributors towards the odor and the taste in a given ingredient such as onion chili tomato cauliflower tamarind etc and created a tripartite data repository wherein recipes was one layer of the data ingredients of which which are uh, of which the recipes are composed of was the second layer of the data and further flavor molecules which are found in these ingredient was the third layer of data and by that way we were now able were able to get a tripartite data structure which is representing indian cuisine all of this was done to ask the question on food pairing that heston blumenthal was suggesting and for that reason we had to look at individual recipes such as the caricature recipe which has been shown here break down the recipe into its constituent ingredients such as these four ingredients that we are looking at and come up with all kind of pairs for example onion and coconut coconut and chili etc all pair wise combination of ingredients and find out how many flavor molecules are shared or how much is the similarity between the two ingredients here we are considering similarity between two ingredient is represented by number of shared flavor molecules with the assumption that the taste and odor or the flavor of an ingredient is made primarily represented by virtue of its flavor profile that's an assumption we are making here but that's a fairly good assumption to make at the first stage having collected these numbers we can take a simple plain average and get the first number which is nothing but the food pairing index which represents not uh, for a given recipe the number of share, average number of shared flavor molecules in that recipe having got this number remember this is the first time a recipe has been quantified which is otherwise extremely qualitative in terms of its taste and flavor right 
and this has been done by using the molecular basis of each ingredient the flavor basis of each ingredient that goes into the recipe all of this exercise was done in the context of the fact that what would happen if in these ingredients were being put together randomly as opposed to being by product of cultural evolution recipes have evolved as part of cultural evolution by impact by, by virtue of being impacted by geography climate culture genetics and other factors playing a role that's how the recipes have been shaped but had these factors not been playing a role what would have happened to the recipes if you ask that question turns out that the recipes would have had a random architecture they would have been put together in an absolutely random fashion that's what we assumed and we called it a monkey cuisine compared to a monkey cuisine the western cuisines tend to have positive food pairing by virtue of having ingredient pairs which are very much similar to each other by in terms of their flavor profiles what we observed in the context of recipes that we had compiled from tarla dalal's data was that incidentally these recipes are characterized with a contrasting blend of ingredients these recipes tend to have ingredient combinations opposite to what has been found in the case of western cuisines a blend of ingredients that are very very different in terms of their flavor profile they are uh, having less and less sharing of the flavor, flavor profiles that's what we ended up observing and this is what we characterized or called it as contrasting blend or negative food pairing the other experiment that we did which will be the last experiment that i'll be telling as part of this story was to find out what is the role of placement of ingredients of a given category if i were to shuffle ingredients of vegetable category what would happen to the food pairing index this is the food pairing index originally of the cuisine that's what we just saw it is on the contrasting side as opposed to the monkey cuisine which is somewhere here okay what would happen if i were to look at the whole cuisine and were to shuffle vegetables within vegetable category every vegetable will be shuffled and will be kept with some will be shuffled with some other randomly picked vegetable from the basket of vegetables everything else being the same all other ingredients are being kept as it is if you do this experiment turns out that independently when this experiment is done for each category the food pairing index changes only marginally suggesting that shuffling within category the so called intra category shuffling of uh, ingredients doesn't make much of a difference in terms of its food pairing index possibly that has some bearing on the taste and the the flavor of the recipe itself but we won't make such far reaching uh, conclusions we shall only consider the food pairing index and we find that indeed these categories seem to be rather indifferent to the food pairing index on the contrary there is one category which seems to be rather critical in deciding the food pairing index and you can guess what category that would be in the context of indian cuisine and indian recipes turns out that if you were to do the shuffling i mean you can think about it the audiences can actually pop answers in case you have any answer to this but incidentally the one category that seems to be rather central and critical in deciding the food pairing index is that of the spices if you were to shuffle spices and were to put cardamom instead of clove and clove uh, and some other uh, cinnamon instead of clove uh, and such kind of shuffling if you were to do it randomly in the indian recipes then the food pairing index dramatically changes from what it was to what it would become more like a monkey cuisine suggesting that spices are the molecular fulcrum of indian recipes right so that's the conclusion that we drive and this conclusion is extremely robust regardless of which recipes we end up taking uh, uh, whether we we have expanded our repository from what was only 2543 to close to 10000 recipes and despite that this particular observations remain remains extremely stable that's how we concluded that spice is the taste of india and that is something which characteristically defines what indian cuisine is all about and we went ahead and created what could be called as a culinary fingerprint like a dna fingerprint which characterizes a human being culinary fingerprint characterizes a cuisine and tells us the quintessential aspect of a cuisine which category of an ingredient contributes most to the food pairing etc like that we found out that spices and dairy products 
are key contributors to the food pairing across all the regional cuisines that we had investigated. <clears throat> and the nature of contribution changes from one regional cuisine to other regional cuisine, thereby telling us something unique about each of the cuisine that we have seen. This is what we characterized as or named it as culinary fingerprints and have published it in, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a scientific journal. <clears throat> Going beyond Indian cuisine, we have also characterized the culinary fingerprints of more than 26 world regions and around 84 countries across the world, across the world in terms of their culinary fingerprints to find out what is so unique and characteristic of each of these regional cuisines from across the world. This research, which was done in 2015, published in 2015, was declared as an emerging technology by MIT Tech Review and was, uh, was considered to be best of 2015 among the research articles that were published on archive. This has got much publicity from the media, given the fact that we are looking at one of the unique cultural heritage from coming from Indian, uh, Indian recipes and Indian cuisine and has been highlighted in root food by Veer Sangvi and various other news outlets, more than 200 news outlets have published it, including scientific portals such as Chemistry World have highlighted it. And chefs have been inspired by the research that we have done to consider how to tweak the recipes by looking at the food pairing pattern that we have observed in various world cuisines, Indian cuisine being the pinnacle of those. And this is one of the examples of that where chef Garima Arora, a Michelin star, uh, chef has used our research for shaping her recipes in a restaurant. It is also considered to be the sweet spot of uh, the food, given the fact that this is one of the earliest studies which has looked into food from a data perspective and has tried to blend food with data and the power of computation. This is where, when we looked back, I decided to name this area as a computational gastronomy and we went further and invested ourselves in, in my lab to investigate the computational gastronomy, various aspects of computational gastronomy, build various databases around computational gastronomy arena and build algorithms which can be used to ask interesting questions in computational gastronomy. Having told you this story, now what I would like to do is to tell you about the future of computational gastronomy and how information science, data science can play a big role in shaping what the way we'll be looking at food in decades to come. This is not going to happen in a day or two. Computational gastronomy is where physics was at, uh, physics was in 16th or 17th century. There is a lot of potential, but there is a lot of work to be done. Huge amount of data needs to be organized around food, around recipes across the world, the ingredients in them, the flavors in them, the nutritional value, the health impacts of the ingredients and various other data which can be collected about the food. But before telling you about the future of that, future of computational gastronomy, I would like to tell you about what are the shortcomings that we have encountered in the study that was done in 2015. What we realized is that we have, we have fallen prey to the reductionism that typically physicists tend to approach any given complex topic. Given a topic of modeling a cow, a typical mathematician or a physicist would start with an assumption by saying that let's assume that the cow is spherical. And that obviously is not the truth, but that gives us a very good assumption to get started off with, depending on what is the question that we are answering. And that is how we started by assuming that a recipe is nothing but a set of ingredients, which it is not. The order of the ingredient matters. The kind of processing that is being done on the ingredient matters. The kind of flavor molecules that go into each ingredient matter. The concentration of the flavor molecules also is critical and the potency of the flavor molecule is, is also of value. That makes a huge difference in how the flavor is going to come out in a cooked recipe. All of these factors were completely ignored and we would like to point out that these need to be incorporated while we are building this area further to ask more interesting questions and deeper questions in computational gastronomy. And I'm sure many of these questions would have come to your mind as you were, as I was telling you about the story that unfolded in 2015 in my lab at IIT Jodhpur. What we are trying to do in the future, uh, starting from 2016 onwards, is to build databases and algorithms to make food computable. 
and that itself is a major challenge because so far food has never been computable the data of food has not been compiled in a in a systematic manner to make it computable the idea behind this is to achieve data driven food innovations can we come up with applications of databases and algorithms such uh, thus devised is the question that we are asking here and why do we so there are three dimensions that we are looking at the first dimension is that of the recipes and the data of recipes the second is that of the molecules data coming from each of the ingredient and finally the dimension of nutrition and health is what we are looking at each of these i will be spending a little time to explain you about how we are working on each of these dimensions and tell you about the future of uh, each of these aspects the first thing is that of the recipes space going beyond only around 2543 from indian recipes that we had compiled now we have a huge repository of a few hundred thousand recipes uh, which have been compiled in a structured manner and this one has particularly 118000 118000 recipes from across the world which includes around 26 world regions and 84 countries which have been compiled in an extremely structured manner and when i say structured i'm talking about recipe its name the cuisine to from where it comes from and when i say talk about cuisine it can be the continent region and the country to which it belongs to specifically in a systematic manner the dietary attribute that the recipe has in terms of five dietary styles what kind of cooking processes such as boiling frying sauteing etc are going into making of the recipe the utensils which are being used for making of the recipe the ingredients which are of course part of this recipe the order in which the ingredients are being put into the quantity unit state temperature whether it is dry and fresh and what size it is being put into the recipe and further the category of each ingredient all of this data in addition to the nutritional profile of each ingredient which has been compiled from uh, united state department of agriculture's comprehensive database of nutritional values this particular repository is a wonderful archive for anybody who would like to explore recipes from the cultural perspective from a nutritional perspective or from dietary attributes perspective or other values for that matter if you would like to investigate so this is one of the first uh, repositories that has been published in a scientific space and is being made available freely for investigation for those who would like to build applications on top of it going beyond compiling the data of recipes from various world cuisines we have also asked an interesting question about the evolution of cuisines and how they are interrelated with each other so we have built information theoretical majors about relatedness of cuisines about how similar or dissimilar they are from each other and have tried to find out try to build a tree of world cuisines and this particular tree is one of the earliest tree that we have built we are refining it further uh, telling us about similarities in terms of cuisines and how they are with matching to each other in terms of ingredient composition and use and less of less use of ingredient or more use of ingredient in various cuisines this also tells us primarily that geographic proximity have played a huge role in shaping similarities of the cuisines apart from the fact that there are certain cuisines which while being away from each other are still very similar to each other so this is the tree of cuisines similar to the language tree that must have seen must have encountered at certain point of time one of the most interesting question that we are asking in our lab is that of how many recipes are theoretically possible given any uh, composition that you would like to create given all the ingredients that are available in the world turns out that the number of ingredients can be estimated to be of the order of 1000 and this number is a very rough estimate and a conservative estimate given the fact that we are bundling all the onions into only one onion category similarly all potatoes are considered to be a potato and similar to uh, and similarly other ingredients are bundled despite they being they having a lot of different varieties in them if you consider all specific varieties then probably the number will come into few tens of thousands our estimate from recipe db is that of around 20000 but then we are going by the conservative estimate of 1000 and a typical recipe has got around 10 ingredients well then 
if you were to make all kind of permutations and combinations then the number of recipes that can be theoretically be possible is of the order of 10 to the power 30 which is more than the number of stars that are there in the whole universe i mean that's a huge number that we are encountering here of course a lot of these recipes would be unpalatable and therefore would be discarded in the process of evolution but nonetheless we would still have a large number of recipes which have not been encountered by cultural evolution question is in 21st century with the power of data and with the power of information architecture the data that has been compiled can we now compile create new recipes is the question that we are asking and that is the direction that we are taking in our lab with the tools of machine learning text mining and natural language processing i don't know how many of you have seen this movie ratatouille maybe we can have raise your hands uh, who, who have seen this movie i'm sure many of you are smiling in your cheek when you are looking at this this particular picture because it's a humorous movie about an adventurous uh, rat which which wants to uh, which wants to cook and the catch phrase which keeps running through the movie by uh, from uh, chef gustav is that anyone can cook so we want to take this uh, adage further and ask this question can computers cook can computers be taught by virtue of structured databases and repositories to cook by creating repository of world cuisines ingredients flavor molecules nutritional value can they be taught how to cook and can they be allowed to capture the intuition that otherwise a human chef or a human culinary enthusiast would have well that's the question we are asking and towards this one of the early articles that we have published is here published in a conference called coling which uh, deals with natural language processing wherein we are trying to create new recipes uh, with the help of data repositories that we have built including recipe db being one of them and remember this creation of such recipes is not very far away from what has been done in the context of music in the context of literature where people are trying to imitate shakespeare or people are trying to Im imitate mozart or beethoven symphonies and computers are to an extent successful in trying to imitate these masters so say in a same manner we are asking this question can intelligence culinary intelligence itself can be imitated and the answer is far too away we believe that the first step will be that of creating recipes uh, which can be fooling a chef we call it a uh, turing test for a chef so we'll be running this experiment very soon by the end of this year well we'll be challenging a chef to uh, recognize a recipe which is computer generated versus the recipe which is human generated that's a challenge that a chef will be will be passed on to and if we are able to fool the chef statistically speaking in a significant manner that a recipe which is generated by a computer is actually a human generated if that's what the chef would think then we'll be partly be successful the next test would be actually cooking these recipes and seeing how palatable these are and that i believe is going to be a bigger challenge for us because not all the attributes uh, would be available to us to make a palatable recipe as of now so this might take a few years before we can become successful towards that end well that was about the recipe space the next space is that of the molecule space given the fact that molecules are key contributors to the taste and odor we took up the job of organizing the molecules the flavor molecules that are found in all natural ingredients that are going into recipes and this i am very proud to say flavor db is the world's global uh, standard for flavor molecules repository today having published in 2016 17 and this compiles more than 1000 around close to 1000 ingredients and their flavor molecules which are a few few hundred few thousand flavor molecules of which these ingredients are composed of and these are experimentally validated flavor molecules using gcms gas chromatography mass spectroscopy studies that has been organized in an extremely structured manner starting with ingredient their natural source from where they come from which plant which animal do they come from the flavor molecule of which are which are found in the ingredient the kind of flavor attributes that the molecule has got and the chemical properties that the molecule has got and may various other interlinked properties are also available as part of flavor flavor db as a database we have gone ahead and published this as an android app to make it available to culinary enthusiasts who would like to do 
a bit of playing around with food pairing because it allows you to find out ingredient combinations which are very very similar in terms of their flavor profile this is under right now it has been taken down because we are updating this flavor db database we have gone ahead and remember that creating repository is not only for the purpose of searching and uh, archiving it and then searching it searching these databases but also towards coming up with predictive tools so this is a predictive tool that we have built for bitter and sweet taste prediction wherein starting with a bunch of flavor uh, ingredient in molecules which have been characterized with bitter and sweet taste we have come up with ways by which machine learning uh, uh, algorithms we have built to come up with a prediction of what kind of a taste it would have and this we have done only for bitter and sweet because the data was not available for all the other tastes such as salty sour and umami in not enough data was available and this data was good enough for us to build algorithm which is a state of the art algorithm and again this data of bitter and sweet molecule the algorithm the software which has been built as well as a web interface which has been denoted at the bottom are all available freely for playing around and remember all of this takes us towards a very interesting application for designing molecules which are having expected level of sweetness but doesn't have enough nutritional value this is important given the epidemic of diabetes that we are facing to have enough number of sweetness which can which which don't add to the nutritional value and that's one of the challenges in the technical space that is that we are facing and this tool allows us to play with that and address that question coming to the last space last dimension that i was talking about is that of the health dimension incidentally we keep coming across various news pieces and articles which talk about whether oil is good for you egg is good for you wine is good for you or bad for for your health which aspect of health it is impacting etc and often times we come up with contradictory assertions about the same ingredient being good and bad for the same disorder and this in my opinion comes because the way food interacts with human body giving rise to health consequences is way too complex to comprehend through simple equations such as the one which has been shown in front of you right it's not so straight forward and that is the reason why we need to put together data repositories of health impacts of food ingredients based on empirical evidence to be able to come up with interesting assertions which are coming from evidence based studies and that's why we ended up building something called dietrx this is under publication under review at the moment it is not yet published but the database is available for exploration for anyone who would like to play with it we have created a in house repository of food and disease associations based on close to 38000 research articles published in the last 90 years and these data are created these repository is created by looking at the title and the abstract of a given research article and the mention of food that has been made in the research article that we have put together and have come up with these food and disease associations food Uh, we have identified using something called named entity recognition methodology uh, and similarly diseases have been identified using ner the named entity recognition of diseases so we have built sophisticated algorithms for identifying the name of a food or a name of a disease in the title and the abstract that's what we have been able to do further we have integrated this data remember it's not all about creating new databases but it also incorporating existing data repositories which are relevant in the context of food so as to create an integrated database so we have integrated that with chemicals that are found in the food and genes which are linked with the diseases thereby creating a quadripartite database of food chemical gene and disease associations and all of these associations are empirically proven empirically validated barring food and gene association which is not available to us as of now that's been only shown for graphical purposes but it is not available with us and dietrx thereby provides you a means by which you can explore this repository for finding out what food is good against a which disease and what food is possibly uh, impacting or causing a particular disorder or a disease as per the medical subject heading and you can go back and 
find out which literature is cite, being cited corresponding to that particular association identified using test mining protocol so that's dietrx for you providing an extensive repository of food disease associations interlinked with chemicals and genes as an application of dietrx we have investigated these data of food disease association in the context of spices and the reason we did this was twofold one is spices are coming out to be critical not only in the context of indian cuisine but many of the cuisines from the world including the oriental cuisines wherein it seems that the herbs and spices seems to be playing a critical role in shaping the food pairing index that was one reason second was the question which is generically being asked is why do we use spices in our food is one of the important question that we ask and one of the interesting answer to this is in terms of the flavor and the fragrance that the spices offer in our food and given that one of the one of the question that is being asked is that the nutritional value is none for the spices so why do we use spices so data of food disease association of herbs and spices culinary herbs and spices was investigated and we found that indeed spices contribute towards various beneficial health impacts and we found that there is a broad spectrum benefit of culinary herbs and spices and that's the conclusion that we drew from the investigation coming from dietrx and that thereby suggesting that herbs and spices have a role to play beyond being value of value for their uh, for their impact for uh, towards flavor and fragrance that they offer to us towards we would like to close in a couple of minutes if that yes. uh, yeah thank, thank you. you thank you so towards conclusion of the talk i would like to tell you that computational gastronomy is a science which tries to blend the data science with food and the power of computation and for doing so we are asking the hypothesis driven questions we are building structured databases and we are coming up with applications based on these databases and knowledge knowledge that we are creating as part of uh, the endeavor of computational gastronomy and one of the possible direction that we see is that of personalized nutrition which seems to be uh, one of the potential uh, space that we are moving into wherein with the help of machine learning data science and computational gastronomy we can build algorithms which can tell us which food should be consumed to improve our health so this is a particular research article which tells us about how do we eat a food which will help us decreasing the post prandial glucose level the glucose level after eating consuming a meal meals uh, which is critical towards indicator towards type 2 diabetes and that's one of the application that i would like to point as i conclude and would tell you about various things that we are doing in our lab including food beverage pairing prediction of taste and odor culinary fingerprinting dietary interventions design of food and beverages and all the way up to moving in the direction of creating sustainable food innovations and all of this has started only 6 years back so i would like to emphasize this that computational gastronomy is a very young area and many of us who are data scientists and computer scientists have a lot to contribute those who have keep any interest even peripheral interest in food can actually contribute to this area by way of investigating the data that is being churned out from our lab so towards the end i would like to stop with this quote which says that the discovery of a new dish confers more happiness on humanity than the discovery of a new star and i have not been able to discover new stars by being an astronomer which is what was my aspiration as a as a teenager but i hope i'll be able to discover new dishes to make humanity happier and healthier with the help of data structuring and information application of information architecture that we are doing in the context of uh, food i would like to thank a large number of my students phd students mtech btech and interns uh, whom i can't even name because of the large numbers that are, that are there and uh, who have contributed towards this research and would stop with that for question and answers thank you thanks a lot professor ganesh this was an amazing conversation and i have definitely learned today that every time i go to the kitchen i produce something from the monkey cuisine domain <laughs> <laughs> all right uh, so i think this is a great story we have about so i would like to say to the audience uh, if you are watching live on youtube you can post your questions on on the live chat if you are on uh, zoom you can use the q and a uh, 
a panel to pose questions and we'll try to take those questions to professor bagler there are we have about eight eight to nine minutes available to do questions before we move on to the new speaker uh, next speaker so uh, i think one of the great things that professor bagler is doing is you've you've taken a concept that is food which is an everyday occurrence for us uh you have used the concepts of information architecture to make sense extract the tacit knowledge that is there or tacit information that is there in food uh made sense of it and you're showing us what is possible once you have made sense of it but tell us how was it when you started off what were the challenges in discovering uh the fact that uh, when food which is often considered a cultural thing or a common uh, thing never thought from a data lens or an information lens uh, how was it to start it start it off and what were the challenges you might have faced at the beginning okay good that you asked that question even as a professor in iit it was extremely challenging where it is considered that freedom is the first thing that is given to you it was extremely challenging uh, because when i started this investigation we start, we created the first compilation of recipes and we did the first analytics and i presented this to a couple of my colleagues who are coming from physics and mathematics background they were extremely critical they said that why are you working on food and recipes why are you looking at these data compiling this data itself was challenging because it was not not easily available names of ingredients were coming in different uh, there were different avatars uh, you know the vernacular languages were being used for naming the ingredients just to give a couple of challenges that we faced right mm -hmm. at the beginning so uh, right from challenges of the data to the challenges from external uh, externalities like people not accepting the uh, analysis as a meaningful science we faced uh, quite a bit of uh, tussle here to take it forward right so you're you're in many ways challenging common notion that we always take for granted that food is food it's something it's completely subjective uh, and and there is no objective quotient to it in, in a way and if you can break it down and structure it so well that kind of gives this new dimension now the the question i have is the the what what do you believe is the role of curiosity and experimentation in order to come up with these dimensions that you're talking about or these uh, uh, these ways of looking at food that you're coming what's the role of experiments and i'll make it a, the question a little larger because of course you'll answer it from a food point of view if someone is taking any other subjective domain like fo from food it can be any other field uh, tomorrow uh, any other field of art uh, as a matter uh, mm -hmm. what is the role of experiments and how do you start to begin to do those uh, uh, get an understanding of this art form right i think any uh creative domain or qualitative domain that we would like to deal from a uh, data science perspective or from a information architecture perspective one need to respect that at some level there is a, there is an intuition which goes into it whether it is music uh, painting a uh, food or similar domains we need to respect that part and it will remain there for a while because we do not know whether we will be able to break down it into entirety Uh, in its structure, in its constituent elements, to be able to apply the tools of computation, we won't know that. But yeah. we can we can start with that. Uh, we can start with that hope that yes, it is possible to break it down at least at its first level. We can break it down into its constituent elements, like we did in the context of food, in terms of ingredients, flavor molecules, nutrition, uh, taste and odor, etc. We can do that. Whether this can be used for challenging human intuition and creativity is a completely different ball game altogether right? right so that is what i would like to suggest that people should not shy away from experimenting and collecting the data and trying to break, break down the uh, qualitative arena into its constituent components one should do that definitely right and how do you figure out what are the constituent components in the first place like if you would uh, catch hold of a common person on the street and say that break down the constituent components of food no one will be able to say oh there are pulses there are meats there are foods like these categories of food that you have, uh, uh, that you had uh, also specified which is very core to information architecture how do you come up with these well these were not easy to come by partly we had to deal uh, partly we had to rely on the scientific literature about what has been talked about these attributes earlier and partly we had to talk to an expert for example a chef we have to uh, connect with them for just to give an 
illustration, I will say that uh, when I was trying to find, come up with uh, uh, cooking protocols, what are the different cooking protocols which are being used? I could not rely on my intuition. I, I created a list of one, uh, I think it was 270 different cooking processes which go into uh, cooking and we uh, presented it to a chef, expert chef, to ask yeah. his or her opinion to find out, okay, to tell us what are the outliers here, what are similar processes, and which could be called as distinguished uh, uh, independent cooking protocols. So that's yeah. a protocol, that is the process that we need to use. Right, so basically go to people who are doing it and get as much learning from them as possible. Okay, yeah. let me take a couple of audience questions at this point of time before I move further. Uh, <laughs> we have about four minutes left for the question and answers. Okay, so the first question that was asked by Kiran Sethi, it is, why do we need to predict bitter and uh, sweet taste. It's very obvious that having a bitter component in a recipe will make it bitter only and same goes with sweet taste prediction. So can you answer this question for us? Okay, this is more from the context of designing a sweetener. So yeah. there is a sweet design, a sweetener industry, which is trying to come up with synthetic molecules, uh, which are sweet in taste, but at the same time don't have nutritional value. And that right. is where there is a possibility that computationally you can design lots of molecules, a million molecules, predict its sweetness value and, and identify only those which are sweet enough, so which can be taken further for their uh, experimentation. That is where predicting sweetness computer in computationally is important, is desirable. Got it. So, uh, Ganendra asks, uh, how personalized nutrition will be different or better than personalized medicine? Uh, uh, is food, can food molecules be used as drugs as well? Uh, I won't go to the level of talk saying that food molecules themselves be used as drugs, but I will talk more about how food itself can be used as a potential mediating agent for treating a disease. Like in the context of diabetes, what you eat is going to trigger your, uh, your postprandial glucose level. And yep. thereby, if you can design or if you can find out food which triggers desirable response in me vis-a-vis -vis Ganendra, that would be extremely wanted. It, it'll be highly desirable, right? I would like to find that out. That is what nutri personalized nutrition is expected to do. It is not expected to go to the level of molecules to find out uh, personalized drug as such. Okay, so here's one question that I briefly touched upon, but this has come from Nitya. Food also has a political, cultural, and religious aspects uh, that are hard to dissociate from. So yeah. if you were to quantify such things or create classifications for them, how would you go about it? So you briefly touched upon that. Anything you want to add for this? Uh, Nitya has touched upon a very interesting aspect of food. Food has got extremely so, uh, science, uh, social aspect of it, political aspect of it. Uh, it is politicized heavily. Think about beef if you want, uh, you know. Uh, so yes, it's very difficult. It's very, very challenging. What we are trying to do is to ensure that the recipe compilation that, that we make is not uh, only allied representation, which is what we were alleged in the beginning, that all the recipes which are documented are coming from allied uh, communities and they don't represent Dalit recipes and uh, tribal recipes, etc. So it is okay. important when I'm declaring a cuisine to be Indian cuisine, that I incorporate enough recipes that are also coming from such uh, not, not allied communities as well. So we try our best to ensure that we, we don't do any dis injustice, uh, you know, uh, to uh, communities which are not represented enough. But to account for political aspect is very difficult. I have not even... Yeah. Okay, the last question from the audience that I'll be taking is what determines whether a molecule or a collection of molecules will have a particular flavor or a new flavor will emerge out of it? Very good question. First of all, uh, individual molecule has got certain taste or odor based on the functional group it has got or combination of functional group it has got. Although there is no clear science available about it, there is, uh, there is artistic people who uh, they are they are flavor scientists, they are called, but they are flavor artists more, less of a scientist. They know how to put molecules together to come up with a desirable taste of a mango or a desirable taste of a tamarind, etc. They know how to do that, right? So flavor arises out partly out of individual molecules' functional groups and partly because of multiple molecules coming together and giving rise to an emergent property. Both of them are contributing towards the final taste and odor. All right. I'll ask the final question as a closure question at this point of time. Uh, after doing so much work, have you managed to create a unique recipe by yourself? 
good question <laughs> and a, and a pinching question at the same time no we have not been able to do so and uh, i i believe that to crack human intuition or rather to crack something which human intuition does is going to take some time uh, so that's a very uh, tough one to break in our lab i must say but we hope to do so in the coming times uh, now that we have algorithm which can design recipes we hope to at least hand pick some recipes uh, which Which are uh, palatable and present to the world, saying that this is a recipe which is coming out of a computer. 